thank you so much for joining uh, this session on Exit to Community. Uh, so good to have you here. Uh, my name is Nathan Schneider. I'm a professor of media studies at the University of Colorado Boulder in the United States. And uh, really looking forward to this discussion uh, today. Um, it, this is a, a kind of complementary framework to, uh, to the platform co-op uh, language and logic. So for instance, you know, I was involved in organizing, co-organizing with Trevor Schultz, the first platform co-op conference and others. So I'm very invested in, in that frame um, and that language. Um, but one thing that it kind of assumes is that people you know, know what um, uh, cooperativism is about and, and um, are interested in that as a starting point. Um, exit to community is a, a kind of language um, a strategy that is oriented around trying to draw um, uh, uh, to, to enable shared ownership in the context of the startup world that we have. Um, the exit is what all kind of uh, uh, mainstream startups are designed to achieve. Exit is what is where the investors get their payoff when the company becomes either publicly traded on a stock exchange or um, gets acquired by another company. And exit to community is um, a, a call for a different kind of option, the possibility of enabling community ownership as the destination, uh, as the, the orientation around which startups might organize. Um, again, this is not a single model. It's not cooperatives or an alternative to cooperatives. It is a kind of umbrella around which many different kinds of models are uh, are being explored and developed. And you'll see different examples of that today among the stories being told here about how different projects are exploring and, and developing, pioneering their own exit to community strategies. And I hope you see um, that this is a way of kind of um, feeding uh, all that has been going on in the platform cooperative world um, into uh, the startup world that we that we presently have, and um, bringing some of those values of solidarity, of democratic ownership and governance um, into um, uh, uh, into the, the the startup world. Um, so, what we're going to do over the course of this session is hear from several um, founders and leaders describing what um, community ownership means in the context of their project and how they have developed processes for enabling shared ownership. Then we're gonna hear from uh, Danny uh, Spitzberg, who's been one of the organizers of uh, this Exit to Community uh, community uh, and, uh, and hear about some of the tools that, um, that, that we've been developing, that he's been leading and developing uh, uh, around um, supporting uh, projects in developing their, their exit to community strategy. Um, so we're going to have several uh, uh, kind of brief speakers, and then at the end, we'll have uh, lots of time for discussion. Uh, so really looking forward to hearing from you. Feel free to put questions in the chat or raise your hand when we get there. Um, I'll be doing a kind of progressive stack uh, uh, to make sure we hear from lots of people. Um, we're going to begin um, with my friend and collaborator, uh, Mara Zepeda of Zebras Unite. Uh, Zebras Unite is an incredible network that has been supporting uh, this work, that has been part of it, and also been practicing it um, in, in the, the organization itself. So, Mira, take it away. Hello, can everyone Sorry, hear me? Mara. Yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> um, hello. All right. I don't have any slides to share. So yeah, Nathan, you brought down the slides. And I'm also not seeing, I'm just going to change my view a little bit. OK. Um, am I, it looks like your box is still highlighted, Nathan. But are, is my box highlighted for other people? OK, cool. Whatever that is, that is. Um, OK, so um, hello. It's so good to see all of you and, and just to be a part of this incredible event today. Thank you so much for joining. Um, as Nathan mentioned, I'm Mata Zapeda. I'm one of the co-founders and the managing director of Zebras Unite. And I'm really excited to share our story today of how Zebras Unite ended up exiting to community, <laughs> because that's essentially what we did. Um, so I want to just talk through that story. 
So I was a founder of a tech company. Um, it was a platform that was serving higher education. And my dear friend, Jen Brandel, who had a company called Harkin that was working in the media and journalism space, we started very similar companies that essentially they were born out of the premise that these institutions serving democracy should listen to and aim to serve their end users. And that did not have a direct business model um, that aligned with venture capital. So if you wanted to essentially strengthen and bolster dinosaur institutions like higher education and journalism, it was not in, it was not going to be a hockey stick market. So on the one hand, we weren't a good fit for venture capital. And then on the other hand, the social impact investing space was not a good fit because it tended to focus on more international development, climate. It didn't really look at democratic institutions as a space of, um, of social impact change. So long story short, uh, fast forward, we connect with two other founders, Astrid Schultz and Ania Williams, and we publish a blog post called Zebras Fix What Unicorns Break. I'll put that post in the chat for those of you that haven't read it. Um, it's a pretty uh, important <laughs> place to start to get to know us and our movement and what we're all about. And at the end of that post, we put a survey that said, are you interested, does this describe your company? Are you looking for mutualistic um, structures for sustainability, for prosperity, for shared accountability, for different ways of doing things that are um, different and distinguished from the Silicon Valley growth at all costs unicorn model, which is what we developed the zebra in opposition to. And we heard from tens of thousands of people. It was quite unexpected and we were pretty blown away. But what we were hearing from founders and investors alike was what we described described them and they wanted to figure out how to be in community together. So we now had on our hands tens of thousands of people from around the world knocking on our door. And we gathered together at a convening called DazzleCon. So a group of zebras is called a Dazzle, which is very fun. Uh, that was back in November of 2017. And the goal was really to create a community design process. So we knew that we didn't want to be a nonprofit. Nonprofits would not have served a community of founders for many different reasons. If those of you that are familiar with the nonprofit industrial complex, it's problematic. It's, it's very rife with problems. Um, and so we had to figure out what type of model did we want to be. And there was nothing off the shelf. And I would say that is um, a salient point around exit to community in general. Today, you're not going to hear about anything that is off the shelf. There are no easy answers to this. The zine that we worked on emphasizes this, that you are going to have to find your own way and stitch it to dig together with tape and twine. So the result of that convening was essentially a very clear message from the folks that gathered that we had to come up with an alternative model. And we were fortunate enough to receive funding from the Omidyar Network and the Kauffman Foundation to do a survey of our members' needs and what their companies needed, and then to be, invest in really the legal infrastructure to create a better um, corporate form. And what we landed on is a hybrid. So we are a cooperative. Um, so, so that whole work was done under a fiscal sponsor nonprofit um, agreement. And then what we ended up building was a cooperative with multiple shareholder classes, which was made possible by a co-op innovation law um, in Colorado. And one of those shareholder classes is a nonprofit, is our .org. And in fact, Nathan sits on the board of that .org. So what you have now is a mutualistic relationship between the mission anchor of the nonprofit as a shareholder of your co-op. What that means is that it receives dividends, and it also has what's called the golden share, meaning if we wanted to sell or if we wanted to take any type of action that would undercut our mission, that would have to go through the board of the nonprofit. So it essentially creates a, checks and, a check and balance for, um, for our structure. So we managed to exit to community. Um, so we have all of these multiple stakeholder groups that are now member owners of the cooperative all around the world. And what this enables now is um, rather than nonprofits, you now have people wildly incentivized to participate because they are member owners. So I'll just give you a few examples of some member benefits. Um, Folks that, that are a part of the co-op receive discounts on platforms like WeFunder so that they have access to crowdfunding campaigns at a more reasonable cost. We have a group of members right now that is attempting to zebrify MBA 
curriculums, recognizing that we need to completely reinvent higher education and those members are empowered to take that forward. We have 25 chapters around the world. And so those chapter leaders are member owners. We have um, a zebra fund in Japan that just raised a million dollars to support century old companies. We have a movement in Berlin and Scotland and Sao Paulo. So what's really special about this is as a cooperative now, all of those chapter leads are able to join as member owners and then to bring their own cultural flavor of that co-op um, to their community. So um, I wanna just quickly on the subject of exit to community, that is how we did it. Um, Nathan and Zebras Unite had the very good fortune of collaborating on a blog post a couple of years ago where Meetup, the platform Meetup what had been um, acquired by WeWork, which for those of you who know was a very distressed unicorn. Thanks if you saw the um, documentary about Adam Newman. So they were trying to offload WeWork, which or Meetup, which was a very valuable platform in and of itself. And we co-authored a piece essentially imagining a different future for Meetup. What would it look like to exit Meetup to all of those member, to the folks that had organized Meetups, to the people that had attended Meetups? And the real sticking point to Meetup exiting to community, we actually got relatively far along in Zebras Unite, like acquiring meetup, which sounds so funny, but we actually had the investors, we had the will. And the thing that was the, the blocker to any of that moving forward was that there was no operational know-how or capacity for how that team might transfer ownership over to those hundreds of thousands of users. So what we're finding at Zebras Unite is that the logjam around implementing um, processes like exit to community really comes down to operational know-how um, to begin to implement these practices uh, inside of organizations. So I will leave you with just um, two final links if it's useful. The first is we are all invited to join the co-op. Um, so we have our final membership, open enrollment membership coming up in December. And after that, those that join us for this year will be invited to our annual general meeting taking place in February. So we would love for all of you to join us so you can feel what it's like to be a member of Zebras Unite and this incredible global community of founders and investors creating the capital culture and community of tomorrow. And also many folks have some questions about how we arrived at our corporate structure. So I'm throwing a blog post in there that has a, um, a little graphic about what our corporate structure is and how we landed there if you're interested in the saga. So thank you so much. I will hand it over, I think, to Priya, if that's correct, Nathan. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Priya is part of the uh, Siri, the cohort that um, Zebras Unite uh, co-led with, with my lab at the University of Colorado, a group of founders from around the world uh, exploring exit to community strategies. Uh, so Priya uh, Krishnamurthy from 200 Million Artisans, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, so excited to see everybody uh, on the panel who also happens to be uh, now a friend and collaborator. Um, so I'm Priya Krishnamurthy. I, uh, well, I'm the founder and chief collaborator, but my um, brand head wants to call my, I mean, wants me to call myself a CEO, which I'm deeply uncomfortable with, uh, but basically that's what I do. Um, 200M, as we like to call ourselves, is an ecosystem enabler. Um, we are not, again, your average startup. Uh, our core mission really is to uh, reimagine the potential for the handmade and the handcrafted. And how do we do this is really by trying to bridge the many gaps in knowledge, resources, and partnerships for India's many, many artisan producers and impact enterprises working in the artisan economy. And we're starting this work with, um, uh, with in India. Um, so a little bit about myself, I think just to contextualize the story itself. Um, so I was trained as a journalist uh, and I've been, you know, I've already had one career in uh, the creative economy, so to speak. I, I've done media, I've done storytelling, I was uh, making music videos. Um, and somewhere along the line, the corporate culture didn't work for me and I sort of transitioned um, to work with the arts. But the one burning question that I had, I think, for the past 10 years of my life was, um, I was seeing all these, you know, um, social impact ecosystems coming up, people were talking about accelerators and incubators and so on and so forth, but there were very few creatives that I was seeing. And I was interviewing these creatives day in and day out. And I was starting to realize that 
there was so much passion in, um, uh, you know, be it a musician, a designer, you know, somebody who runs a small brand. Everybody had passion, but they seemed to have no direction as to how to grow, how to scale, and so on and so forth. Uh, and I experienced that even with the gallery that I was managing, which was a social enterprise. And I was, you know, on an average, I must have uh, managed about 400 exhibitions over a period of two years. And none of these enterprises working in fashion, art, craft, so on and so forth, uh, did they didn't know how to scale. There wasn't a roadmap. And you could say out of sheer frustration. And I'm a lifelong learner, so I keep going back to schools and workshops and so on and so forth. So I ended up going back to school, honestly, just to understand is there an alternative to this whole, you know, scalable hockey stick kind of language? Because the creatives were not interested and ready for it. All they wanted to do was set up a business that was incredibly, that built on their strengths. And that was self-sustainable. They wanted to make money for themselves and they wanted to support the team that they had and create something of value for their community. Um, and honestly, um, I thought I'll find the answers in the US. I did. But uh, in some ways I did, because uh, in my quest to understand this innovation ecosystem, as it were, um, I read uh, the wonderful article and a blog post written by uh, Mara and uh, the rest of the Zebras Unite team. And suddenly it was like one bulb that went off in my head. And I said, oh my God, there is somebody who's talking the language that I think the creatives that I'm working with really need. And uh, I think I stalked Nathan and, you know, uh, everybody on the Zebras Unite team saying, please let me in because I want to understand what you're th thinking through and how you're thinking through this. And I was still in the US last year when um, basically all these enterprises that I had worked with back in India uh, reached out. This was back in April 2020 uh, when COVID hit and it, it was quite bad in India. And none of these enterprises who are basically working with handmade, they're working with artisans. And they, when we talk about artisans, um, these are not studios. These are not small enterprises. These are uh, social and creative enterprises or even nonprofits that you know support sometimes anywhere from 10 artisans to sometimes 45,000 artisans. That's the you know sort of scale of enterprises that we're talking about. And these enterprises did not know how to pay their artisans. And just to also contextualize numbers, uh, when we are talking about a country like India, which is 1.3 billion people, the largest democracy in the country, in the world, let's put it that way. It is the youngest also country in the whole world. Uh, our average age is about 25, I think 20 to 25. So when you're talking about a country as large as India, uh, one of the data points that came up was that officially there are 7 million artisans, but unofficially there are 200 million artisans dependent on craft or handmade for livelihood. Now that's a massive data point to ignore from a policy perspective, from an investment perspective. Uh, where were we going wrong became sort of the you know burning question. When these enterprises reached out uh, to and you know to find support, I started fundraising for one person, started writing stories for another person, and the next thing I knew, uh, there were all these amazing people in uh, the U.S. who said, "Oh, but this is great stuff. We want to support, but you know, where do we find information?" Which is really ironic because there are millions and millions of enterprises. There is no information about them. There is no data set about them. Um, and that's really how 200 million artisans began. It was supposed to be a quiet little blog that nobody went to. Uh, it was uh, created to um, feature, uh, really bridge the information gaps, but feature uh, enterprises that were valid, that were vetted. Uh, and the people sitting in the US and the diaspora could basically put in money into to support COVID. That's how we began. Um, and I had no intention. I'm, I'm, I'll be very honest, I'm an accidental entrepreneur. Um, but uh, a lot of what I had uh, explored uh, via E2C, via, via all these conversations that I was doing around creative economy, that's what uh, it sort of all started coming back. And the next thing I knew, um, there were a whole bunch of volunteers reaching out to me saying, hey, we want to volunteer, we want to support what you're building. And I think one of the first questions I was asked is, what is your vision, mission, and goal? And I was like, I have no clue. Uh, but can we figure it out together? And really, that's what we've done. It's been um, since April 2020. Now we are sitting in November 2020. We've been volunteer-led. So anything that you see of 200M right now uh, has been built by volunteers. They have given their time for free. They have given resources for free. They have, these are some of the best experts in the country in their own field. And these are the people who have actually taken ownership of what you know, the vision of 200M. 
which is really how can they reimagine the potential of the handmade? How can we create value for it? How can we create value for uh, creativity, culture, all these things that uh, that matter to us in small, big and small ways. So um, when we started out, we had no honest direction. Uh, we must have tested out multiple uh, avenues. But the one thing we knew that we could not be just another average startup that uh, wanted to become another retailer. That was not the whole plan. The, the problem was much bigger. It was a much it was a systemic problem that we were dealing with. Uh, so the, one of the first things I think our team, we sat together and honestly, nobody knew what was what we were planning to do and how we were going to go about it. But the, one of the first things that the team said is that one, we need to be ethical. Two, we need to really, really drive collaboration and partnership because it's a deeply siloed, uh, you know, a sector where nobody talks to each other. Everybody thinks they're the competitor of each other because it's also retail led. And the team at that point said, no, Priya, we have to have to go in for radical collaboration, which means that we have to put ourselves out there, which means we need to start giving first before we start expecting anything in return. And really, that was the modus operandi, so to speak. We started hosting conversations. We start and we started doing it, uh, featuring be it artisans or enterprises who have been traditionally sidelined in this whole space. Um, we tried working with digital, we piloted a whole bunch of things. I think the one thing that was clear to us, especially when we went through the whole E2C um, workshop, was that this was something that we truly need to aspire to. And I think it became a lot more clearer for me because how do you compensate for volunteers who have literally taken ownership of what you're building? Because I, I wouldn't call 200 in my own. This is really, it has been built by volunteers. Uh, therefore, it was imperative that uh, the stories that we were telling, what we were trying to amplify, even the enterprises that we were really trying to support, uh, it needed, we needed to create a trust-based system and an approach. Only then will the enterprises who have been traditionally sidelined will sort of trust us and want to sort of work uh, together to sort of grow or accelerate their growth. And we also started telling them that it is okay if you do not want to become a unicorn. I think that also built in confidence with a lot of enterprises we started talking with. Um, and the, the mutual trust has been built ha and con continues being built over time. Um, even with our volunteers, people come and go, but I think I'm just gratified often. Uh, to give you an example, um, one of the projects that we took up uh, and we consciously decided to stay away from retail and all of that. And we said, let's just in address the information gaps. Nobody seems to know what's happening in the sector. We don't know how many artisans, we don't know what is the investment need. We don't know how, what, how digital is going to work. Uh, and somebody gave us, I mean, British Council and uh, gave us a very small grant to do a project, a research project on informality. And we featured about 12 enterprises. And honestly, uh, the money that was given to us was nothing. Um, it was 80% volunteer led and uh, the name of the research, please go and check it out and I will send, uh, share the link in the group. It's called businessofhandmade.com. 80% of that research and what you see on the website was volunteer led. Uh, it was not, we didn't, we only paid the designer and that to much below her market rate and we paid one person. Everybody else worked for free and it was a six month project. Uh, but it's sort of become uh, almost a treatise in some ways because nobody has worked on research on this sector, not at the scale at which, or even in the smallest way we did. Thanks to Business of Handmade, we were able to, and because we have been very conscious that we want to continue building partnerships and trust-based partnerships, we will put uh, all our, as many cards as we need to put on the table uh, to make sure that the trust is built with every kind of partner that we bring on board. And I think Zebras have been, uh, you know, a wonderful sort of, uh, partner along the way. And thanks to Zebras also anchoring what we're doing and supporting what we're doing, we were able to confidently um, pitch for another research project and this time become a little more ambitious with our goals, which was, uh, and we received the catalytic capital grant this year. Uh, and again, uh, the three partners that are part of this conversation uh, that pitched for this project, Zebras Unite, TSIC, the Social Investment Consultancy, and 200M, we all met at the E2C cohort, which is why, and you know, the, it's amazing how uh, as three different partners, we trust each other implicitly on what, how we need to support each other. Um, so that's for, I think for me, that's honestly been our E2C journey. And finally, after one and a half years, uh, we've also now we are part of the Zebras cohort, uh, co-op, 
uh, and we for us now the focus is as we move forward while we continue uh, creating more research and insights and evidence for the sector uh, we also want to bring in uh, resources for entrepreneurs that we are trying to support uh, but essentially it's also about offering a whole new kind of approach to um, and a trust-based approach really to even communities that we're working with to enterprises that we're working with to let them know that it is okay that they do not want to become unicorns it is okay if they just want to remain self-sustainable uh, it is not their job to do research it's our job to do research um, that these are things that we have to um, i think there is a long process of trust building that needs to be done in a sector as fragmented as this as informal as this um, and somewhere the more we dig into it we're also beginning to realize that the change has to happen bottom up it cannot just be people who speak english that have to be you know foregrounded on forums like this which is why we made a conscious decision to also foreground artisans because honestly they are the repositories of knowledge we are fighting over all this and we are wanting to do this because somewhere we deeply believe that creativity and culture which is part of the indian identity uh, unless we protect and preserve it, um, it's all going to be lost. Um, and then we can't reclaim any of this. So in a sense, I think that's where we are at. We're very young in our E2C journey, but uh, I can say that we are committed to the idea of E2C. I think it's really important that the community plays a part uh, as we move forward. We're also committed to worker ownership. I, what we're struggling with, of course, is the governance piece. We don't know when, how, all of that. And we are also very consciously much like um, what Mara suggested, we did not want to become a non-profit. We are a for-profit, but we know that eventually we might have to become a hybrid. But for now, we want to work within the sort of frameworks of a for-profit governance structure. So really, that's where we are at. Um, I'm happy to share. Uh, please do check out Business of Handmade uh, because we're really proud of what we've done. Um, and uh, yeah, please follow our newsletter and all of that. And uh, yeah, if anybody feels generous enough to support uh, us uh, operationally, that would be fantastic because we would at some point like to pay our volunteers as well. That's all from me. Thank you so much. Um, and I really recommend that report, um, the Business of Handmade report and the, the event um, that was hosted by Zebras Unite about it recently. Um, one thing that really struck me from the speakers uh, there were, were, were the dangers um, and the challenges that investor ownership can present to industries like this, where, um, where there really is a risk of perverse incentives. And it's so important to create, you know, the, um, that community ownership to make sure that, um, that the, you know, these businesses can really be, be centered in, in the work. Um, uh, our uh, last entrepreneur story here comes from Austin Roby. Uh, who is uh, founder of Ampled, a platform co-op that you may have come across in the platform co-op world uh, that is also uh, exploring a strategy around, um, around community ownership with some, with some new technology. Um, Austin's been um, kind of a, 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 you know, a compatriot uh, with, with me in the world of entering, you know, bringing cooperative values into the, the cryptocurrency world and, and uh, blockchain. And uh, so really excited to hear about, about uh, the process that they're developing in Ampled. Um, go ahead. Hey, how's it going? Um, yeah, um, <clears throat> thanks for having me here. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess uh, now we get to talk about crypto, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I'll just give a bit of, of background about uh, Ampled, um, which is, um, uh, I'll throw in a link, I'll throw a few links in here as we go. But yeah, this, this, is, this is Ampled, which is uh, a platform uh, that allows for uh, direct recurring community support for musicians. So think about it like kind of like a, a Patreon for musicians um, as a co-op, so collectively owned by the artists and workers. Um, additionally, with uh, community members, which we've carved out some governance rights for, which I think uh, Danny and Nathan are community members of Ampled. Um, and yeah, this this model was developed like in direct opposition to something like Patreon, which is kind of become. Um, like a cautionary tale 
I guess like it's the opposite of exit to community is just like exit to like from investors to whatever to a SPAC or go public or I don't know if if Google or Facebook would ever buy Patreon but um, yeah the I mean something that like from the start I would say it's like an entrance with community because like like we haven't had to like think about like what's the change in ownership model going to be uh, from the start, like very influenced by Zebras Unite and have like internally adopted this metaphor from Ania from Zebras Unite of like thinking about uh, Ampled as a platform, like a local bar where like a local bar can be uh, perceived as successful um, if it has a community of people that show up, have fun, there's money that, that keeps the lights on. And that in itself can be an institution to hundreds of people uh, and, and can be self-sustaining. So that's like how we've thought about Ample, which is like from, from the start, no exit. So like, I guess, um, like, yeah, what I would share, um, you know, like, are, are maybe like some observations that I've, that I've seen uh, particularly in the, uh, Ethereum on what's being built there and then uh, exploring how that can be applied not only to Ampled but to other um, collectively run or collectively owned groups. And like, since this is like, an, like exit to community is not, uh, is not necessarily about co-ops, right? Like the, the goal is collective ownership, collective governance. And I think there's a lot of interesting things that we could um, uh, look at as possibly effective ways to achieve what we value here, but at greater scale and imbue our values onto things that maybe greater enable that. So I just threw in another link in here, something that I've written about this idea of uh, um, community tokens, which are often like a proxy for uh, financial upside and decision-making power and how that can be applied to an existing cooperative. So when I think about exit to community, I, I think um, at least uh, from, from my perspective, more about like, how do we resource uh, collectively owned businesses? Um, this is like, obviously a struggle that everyone here is familiar with. Um, and so, Ample has actually participated in uh, an accelerator or cohort that's actually like pretty well regarded in the, the kind of like social or cultural crypto space now called Seed Club. And we've been exploring like, what does it look, well, what would it look like if Ample um, uh, was able to, to recognize the value that's contributed to the network in, in an interesting way um, that expands beyond what we're currently doing which is numbers on a spreadsheet for hours that people have worked. What, what would it look like if we could recognize the value that everyone has contributed, uh, not only on a Google sheet, but on like a global collectively owned computer, Ethereum, which like your hours or your value that you contribute, that you contribute to Ample could be ownable, portable, tradable, like outside of, of Ample as a network. Um, could that be a way that to bootstrap cooperatives? I think it can be. And I just like would quickly share like some examples that I've seen, um, which, so one, one example um, is a group called Forefront. Uh, actually, there's an interview, I interviewed Nathan uh, for Forefront um, a few months ago. Um, Forefront is a web-based publication. It writes about social and community tokens and DAOs. Um, and has its own token. Um, what is really interesting is it's fully collectively run and people earn forefront tokens by contributing. That could be contributing to a newsletter, writing articles, editing, hosting events. And what I've seen is uh, an incredibly engaged community um, that's actually capturing real value and, and is filled with very thoughtful people that are actually like carrying a lot of cooperative ideas forward. Um, 
I met someone in New York last week and stop me if I'm talking for too long, sorry. Um, <laughs> but uh, but uh, I, I met someone that like in New York last week that was that all, all this person does is contribute to several DAOs and uh, for these like native community tokens, which actually have value because other people like there's there's secondary markets for for uh, some of these community tokens. Um, I think about like friends with benefits is another interesting group to look at a group with between one and 2000 members um, valued at $100 million. Like, I think it goes to show that that networks don't have to be incredibly large to be valuable. Um, and that's that's a, a, a discord and um, now like more IRL community that centers around uh, this really interesting model of having friends with benefits tokens to become a member. And so really cool, uh, like cultural community of, of builders in there. Uh, and then I would also just like point to what I think is like the most real life example of exit community that I've seen recently is the ENS airdrop of the ENS uh, Ethereum name service. If you, if you had set up and helped build value for this network of creating your own name or creating like a a name, a do domain that your wallet address would point to. Um, last week, I think, um, there was an airdrop of ENS tokens, which govern this protocol, govern Ethereum name service. And it's 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 actually ended up being like, sometimes like tens of thousands of dollars worth of value for each person. Um, in order to claim these tokens, you actually had to delegate votes and vote on a constitution for this protocol. Um, and so there's like, there are like really incredible stewards of this protocol. I felt really good about who I had delegated my votes to. And this, uh, you know, I think we should be like, take, what was that? Hmm. Oh, I don't know what that was. Uh, I think we should take uh, cues from some things that are happening. Um, I think there's a lot that we could fork. I think there's a lot that we could look at to like help achieve some of the things that we collectively care about here. Thank you so much, Austin. Um, uh, there, there's so much there, so much to explore, um, and also some, I think, really important tensions between the commitments of, of uh, you know, platform co-op community and, and uh, some of what's going on in crypto. Um, and uh, thank you for, you know, helping to, to surface those. Um, finally, we're going to turn before we open up for questions and conversation um, uh, to Danny Spitzberg, who was, for instance, involved in, in putting together the, uh, the cohort uh, of founders exploring exits to community, putting together the video that you saw at the beginning of this session. Um, and he's going to share some work uh, that is part of a broader uh, picture, broader effort to, to build infrastructure to support uh, projects thinking about their ownership structure. Uh, so a big part of what Exit to Community is all about is, is making it easier for community ownership to be available to founders. Um, uh, as we turn to Danny, be thinking of questions you want to raise. I've been keeping track of things people have surfaced in the chat, but um, lo we'd love to hear from, uh, uh, from you all. So uh, uh, in the meantime, turn it over to Danny Spitzberg. Hi, everybody. So glad to be here with, uh, what's it been, six or some years of platform cooperativism conversations and some some uh, initiatives like what we heard from Mata and, and Priya and Austin and a lot of you here. Um, if you haven't taken a sec yet to introduce yourselves in the chat, now would be a good time since we're getting to the end in uh, about the next 20 some minutes. Um, so to introduce myself and to just share really a couple of minutes on this uh, one tool, uh, my name is Danny Spitzberg, and I work with a staffing cooperative that does training with folks of, across a variety of work, uh, you know, bookkeeping and, and vaccination, but also my specific area is facilitating worker-led research. And as someone who's been uh, an, Great, gratefully invited to a number of the platform cooperativism gatherings and other areas and being in good community with Mata and Priya and Austin and Nathan and so many of you. It's all I can do, I suppose, in a way to help, like Nathan said, offer some tools. Because a lot of talk is cheap 
not all of it, some of it's very valuable. And a lot of the idea of a platform co-op as a sort of entity in itself is a little difficult to grapple with, but the idea of cooperativism is a lot more easy to relate. So similarly, with an exit, folks know that it's for better and for worse in the culture and the capital and the community as the zebra's sort of uh, language. And so how do we do something better? How do we hack that or, uh, if you don't like that language, to, to uh, improve on that process? This tool I'm going to share in the chat is a ownership canvas. Some of you may know the business model canvas. It's been out there for a number of years, I think almost 17 years now. And you know, millions, literally millions of people have used it to figure out their uh, value proposition and their customers. But when it comes to co-ops, there's a lot of hand wringing and people say, well, what is, is it really a co-op? Who owns it? Should we all be owners? Yes, let's all be owners. And not everyone needs to be an owner of every enterprise, um, truthfully. So the question is, and I'll just share this very simple one block of this canvas. This isn't too fancy, it's the first version, but uh, a number of folks have used it. And uh, Greg uh, Brodsky from the Start.Coop Accelerator uh, was a, a critical partner in developing this. This canvas is a complement to the business model canvas, right? Businesses need to work. You need to have something valuable to own if you want the asset to be worth your time. And the business model canvas is a pretty good tool for the job, but you look at that tool and you could think that Amazon, for example, is doing just fine. So the ownership side of the, the, can, of the, of the conversation helps surface the question of, are the folks who own this thing its best stewards for the long term? Are they the ones who may benefit from it? This is, in a lot of ways, why Exit's community is, a, is an important concept and hopefully framework over time. It also asks, who are the most important folks most aligned with the long-term benefits? and the long-term success of a business. So this one block that I'm just gonna highlight asks to differentiate who are your member owners and separately, who are the non-owner stakeholders, the folks who certainly do depend on and care about and love and cherish what you do for them, but may not be aligned as much with the long-term success of the business. They may be in the neighborhood or in the, in the literal local area. They may be folks around the world who believe in international solidarity, but are not legally able to do whatever, who knows? So I offer that one little prompt as a part of figuring out the ownership side of what is and what ought to be. And hopefully this tool helps some of you start to actually put some of these ideas to practice. There's also a session tomorrow if you really wanna get some more hands-on experience with it and I'll drop the uh, Zoom registration page link in the chat in a sec. Uh, so that's all I have to say, and um, I'm glad to be with you all. I'm glad we have some time for conversation. Oops, sorry about that. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so, so much. Um, we've got some questions starting to come in. Um, there are a couple of questions first from Abe uh, Gruswitz. Uh, uh, Abe, do you want to share a bit about local economies and energy impact? Um, you should be able to unmute. Able to unmute. Oh, sure. Yeah, I just was um, curious about people, how, you, how people see their um, platforms as um, helping people build local economies and, and local localized organizing and also on the environmental side of things. Um, if you are measuring um, your energy impact in, in this work. Great, thank you. And any uh, panelists wanna, wanna start out with that? Uh, um, hmm. I'm probably not the best to answer this. I mean, energy, uh, impact of, of, of using um, Slack to communicate, um, energy impact of standing up, like some artist pages, having some hosting, like um, 
we don't have an office or drive anywhere. I think like, like it's uh, like at, at our scale, it hasn't felt worth measuring. Um, so anyways, that was not a very helpful answer, but I'll pass it to someone else. I can probably go next. Um, uh, can you hear me? Uh, because I noticed uh, somebody had said that you can't hear me well enough. Yeah, I can hear you. Um, you're just a little quiet. So if you're able to turn your microphone up a little bit, I think that would help. But I can hear you and can always just turn up our speakers a little bit. Yeah, OK. Uh, I don't think I can do much about it. But uh, I think uh, we talked about regional economies and how we are supporting regional economies. I think uh, <clears throat> when we talk about uh, the artisan economy, particularly, and not just in India, in any, any part of the world, uh, that there's a massive cross-section of communities that work within the informal space and the informal economy. And we are talking about at least 60% of the world operating within informal economies. When we talk about that kind of work, uh, basically these people operate under the radar. There's no digital footprint that they have. They, we don't know how, how they consume, what they consume. Often it is uh, done in barter and so on and so forth. So our traditional language of... Um, growth and scale and all of that has always focused around how do we build the next Amazon, but rarely are we asking questions around how do we support these communities to one come out of, you know, because when we talk about informality, there's also the question of they, do, they operate without social protection, which means they don't have access to what we all of us take for granted insurance. Um, you know, banking, access to digital, um, and just equal pay, uh, you know, worker uh, protections, and so on and so forth, which, you know, in our companies and organizations, we can fight over. But these communities don't have access to that, nor do they have access to government schemes and, you know, policy initiatives. Uh, and therefore, I think for us, the first leg in how we are working and how we are trying to approach this whole sector is that acknowledging that these are communities, one, could be uh, that operate within the whole informal space. These are small cultural communities. Uh, they are sustainable communities. They are not looking for. Uh, uh, they are not looking for a lot. What they want is their paycheck. They want to be able to pursue their creativity and culture and to coexist really with other communities in the space. So therefore, it becomes really important. The question of scale and the conversation around scale becomes really important because what we are hoping to do here is to support small businesses, small creative and cultural businesses, which again, have been traditionally sidelined from a policy education and innovation perspective. So that is really how we think of it. And we are very, very clear that what we are supporting is the regional economy. Honestly, if none of these enterprises go on to become unicorns, we are we are completely okay with it. In fact, we don't want them to become unicorns. We'd rather they you know, continue to thrive, they continue to, um, grow in self-sustainable ways and they continue to uh, feel continue to create value for what they take pride in so that's how we look at our role and enabling them um, to sort of reach that goal is where we think we come in i don't know if uh, we am answering your question when it comes to also when it comes to climate change uh, again um, did you know that the artisan economy already hits about 11 of the 17 SDGs? So we already have a lot of this documented. There are many enterprises that work at the intersection of biodiversity. Uh, they work at the intersection of wildlife. They work at the intersection of agriculture. Uh, the thing is these models and the models of coexistence already exist. It's just that they haven't been documented. So uh, which is also for us supporting this economy means we are supporting climate action, we are supporting inclusion, we are supporting uh, livelihoods uh, at scale, uh, but also from an impact first perspective, as opposed to saying, oh, you know, these are all like great bucket list check marks and boxes that we need to take. No, I don't think we are looking at it that way. Uh, that needs to be tangible for the communities and only if the community then says, hey, this matters to us and this is of value to us that um, sort of we go forward with anything. I hope that answers your question. I think that was great. Uh, Mara, do you have any further thoughts about local organizing? 
Yeah, I mean, I would say, first of all, you know, do check out the chapters that Zebras Unite has. Um, those are all examples of local organizers that have taken the zebra ethos and as members, they're building their own chapter programs focused on the local <clears throat> culture that most aligns. So for example, Scotland or chapter in Scotland is working with the Scottish government. I think they just launched a 15 million pound fund to support clean tech companies. And our zebra chapter lead is the manager of that fund. Um, so I would just encourage you to check out it's zebrasunite.coop slash chapters. I'll put in the chat and you can start to get a sense of all of the different local chapters and their different focus areas from an organizing perspective. I guess my personal passion is in policy and um, I helped to start a chamber of commerce called Business for a Better Portland, which is an effort to bring together these businesses that are looking for different policy initiatives as interventions to create investment, as interventions to create alternative um, or, uh, alternative um, corporate structures inside of their state as an example to make it more co-op friendly or more whatever the format you'd like friendly is. So I would say local policy initiatives are also a massive underexplored area. And we, if you are, are passionate about policy, be, please get in touch because that is an area that all of our organizations are under-resourced in and we would love to figure out ways to advance that agenda. Um, and then I would say the third place to look is, you know, there are entrepreneurship 501c4s, which are um, advocacy organizations like in the States, it's called uh, Right to Start and Victor Huang is leading that. He used to be at the Kauffman Foundation and that's an entire policy platform that aspires to incentivize and support startups and entrepreneurship. Um, there's, so there's a couple of different flavors there, but those are the resources and recommendations that I would have to focus more granularly at the local level. I mean, that's where all of this work is happening. So it really just comes down to finding your people. Thank you. Um, I also saw there was a question from, um, Marta Sanchez, uh, Minaro. uh, Marta, do you, do you want to, uh, say more about your question for Priya? Uh, or did she answer it there? It would be great to hear hear what's on your mind. <laughs> uh, hi, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, yes, more or less it's the, the question that I've um, done in the chat. Uh, I, I'm interested in knowing the step-by-step strategy to organize the huge amount of artisans, but I think more or less she has answered me to that question. But if she would like to bring further details I would expect that that will be great. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Martha. Um, I'd be curious to also understand, uh, you know, do you work with artisans? Do you have an enterprise uh, that works with artisans? In, in yes, yes. I, I work for the local government of Rosario in Argentina. Uh, mm -hmm. We provide some kind of training courses to artisans. And so that's my interest. Uh, so, about um, the question I, that's why yeah so, yeah i mean i think for uh, from a 200 million artisans perspective we don't necessarily work directly with artisans but we work with art uh, with enterprises that then hire artisans or then support artisans but to your question on how the scale is achieved and how do you end up supporting anywhere between 3000 to 40000 artisans there are very specific case studies that are available on Business of Handmade. Jaipur Rugs, for example, works with 40,000 artisans and they've built a very interesting model around distributed ownership and decentralized doorstep entrepreneurship. And therefore, they're able to scale uh, a for-profit enterprise or a hybrid enterprise of, uh, as such uh, to uh, many states and over 600 villages across India. So it's a fantastic model to look at. Another one uh, which also talks about decentralized scale uh, is um, industry and Rangasutra and a couple of others that have created, uh, they don't expect the artisans to go to factories. They take the work and the raw materials to their homes. And that's how, uh, and they create these community centers at different places. And that's how they're able to sort of really scale their impact because then the, um, the overheads are low, um, you know, they work with the community, understand the challenges of the community and help them really then create value through craft. Um, and these are successful um, 
uh, profitable business models. So uh, I would really behoove you to take a look at Business of Handmade because we have talked about some of these kind of models and to answer your question. Okay, many thanks, Priya. Thank you. Um, we still, uh, we've, we've got about 10 minutes left for, for questions. So please, um, you know, either raise your hand in Zoom or, or uh, put questions in the, in the chat. Oh, okay, uh, Felix, so good to see you. Felix, do you wanna give voice to your question? Okay, um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, good to see you all and to be part of this uh, very interesting session. So I just wanted to ask if you have tools for something like an exit to community by design, which I understand as like designing a startup that maybe in the beginning phase for growing from, from nothing to, to a viable business, um, chooses the classical way, way and works with VCs, but has a some way of defining that at a certain point it will transform into a co-op and exit community? That's my question. Great question. Um, I'll just say a few things and then um, I'd love to turn over and you know, maybe I'd love to hear if, if uh, particularly um, plans around Zebras Unite to help support changing these options. But we have seen um, in the cohort we had um, uh, some cases where projects were venture backed and um, for one reason or another, maybe things didn't go the way that the venture capitalists expected them to go. And so exit to community became an option um, kind of unintentionally. Another case um, is one I'll, I'll share a link in the chat, a platform called Open Collective, which did actually take venture funds early on, but they did it in, in a way that left a kind of community ownership option open because they were working with values aligned investors um, and uh, and they didn't take too much. Um, and so now because of that, they were able to, to get that early investment, get the, the business going, grow on their revenue. And uh, now they're in a powerful enough position to be able to be having open conversations with their users about um, uh, about uh, what an exit to community might look like. Uh, other uh, other thoughts for for Felix's question. Yeah, I would just chime in and say like two of the most um, promising paths that we've seen. I mean, so I think I'm understanding your question essentially, Felix, around. Uh, this question of money and revenue, essentially, and like, where does it come from? And how do you make it happen? And how can you make investment and ha happen? I would say the two most underexplored um, options there are to have some type of relationship with a nonprofit. So if you are able to essentially have a fiscal sponsor nonprofit that then hires your co-op through very above board transparent practices to deliver that contract, that is all um, kosher. So a lot, and, and you know, I'm sure Priya can speak to this too, right? But it's having some type of relationship with a nonprofit or a fiscal sponsor. An open collective is a great example. Zebras Unite served that function with um, business of handmade. Um, you know, obviously, for those of you that don't know, nonprofit fiscal sponsors will take a percentage of the grant funding that you secure for overhead and administrative that ranges, and then they can contract with you to do the delivery. So of the many zebra companies that I know, the grant funding has just fueled such incredible um, growth and survival to be able to call on that. And there are so many different creative ways that they've worked on that. So I would suggest um, just uh, you know, feel free to pose that question in our online community. People can provide examples. And um, the other uh, suggestion is, frankly, to, de to grow a services arm. Uh, I have saved and, and transformed and helped to be a part of the transformation of a number of companies that were tech only to start. And then you begin to realize that you have intellectual property that you can monetize and you can close five figure contracts, whether that's coaching, workshops, consulting to the space that you would that you are an expert in. It's the most it's the fastest and most direct way that I've seen to get revenue. It's 
it's non-dilutive. And then the contracts end up being way larger than tech and you end up building relationships with your customers and end users. So I will be, um, you can find me advocating for services arms for zebra companies all day long because they they meet all of those goals. So if you're interested in learning more about that, this uh, company that I helped to start, Harkin, has that blended software and services model. It ends up being something that's quite frequent in um, venture capital company funded companies, and a lot of folks just don't talk about it. But it's a really extraordinary way to grow revenue too. Thank you. I think uh, Danny wanted to add to this. There's um, nothing more I can say for what Mata said than yes, it's really important to offer some offering, some service, something that people can say, thank you, this is useful for me. I would love to be in a reciprocal relationship with you, maybe offering you money or other things in exchange. So that's a really important way to start getting community bonds. I think the um, Wishful thinking that a community just wants your startup is uh, really dangerous because first the community that has it already are the investors and the co-founders, if you have investors, right? That's a community that exists and the users and the workers, they may not be organized at all or want to because they're busy with other things. So providing services like Mata saying, having a very caring stewarding arrangement with some kind of uh, fiscal sponsor helps make that possible. And those relationships, whether they're from commerce or whatever, can grow. Um, definitely want to also say there is tomorrow that training that I mentioned. I'll put the link again in the chat. And um, I will share a uh, draft checklist of a tool that we're working on to help figure out that roadmap. But the key piece of it is a transition committee of some kind. All the groups we've seen that are trying to decenter their charismatic leader have found some group of folks to help uh, facilitate the succession or the transfer of power or the shift of who's making what decisions. So one key piece is to think about what committee might exist. And my favorite example right now is um, Group Muse, which I think is around the world. But anyway, they have home concerts, you know, classical music, mostly. Um, you know, soon again in, in person. And they had 10 musicians come on and say, you all figure it out. Whatever you wanna do is gonna be great. You are gonna uh, adjudicate that musician ownership. What are the benefits for you? What do you want out of this? Go for it. So there are many different instances. You can invite a few folks to become that committee, that task force, that uh, host party, whatever you like, call it what you want, make, make some fun out of it and think about who gets that um, uh, show on the road. It may not be you. It probably should not be you as the folks who brought the thing to life. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I think this is a good, a good place to, to wrap up. Um, once again, uh, you know, hope this, this conversation has been useful. Um, you can find more materials about Exit to Community uh, at uh, e2c.how, uh, which is a website that we're uh, in the process of building out. Um, you know, it's a way of opening conversations with your startup uh, tech-focused friends about shared ownership in different kinds of forms. Um, got a lot of different creative strategies that folks are building uh, uh, toward that. And and hope you can come to the, the workshop um, uh, tomorrow as well. This video will be posted. Please feel free to share. Um, I'm going to put up a, a last pitch here for the uh, upcoming workshops um, uh, for the rest of this virtual conference. Lots of really good stuff happening. Um, but thank you above all for joining us, for being part of this discussion. Thanks to those who raised questions and comments. Uh, it's so good to hear from you and, um, and please be in touch. Goodbye for now. Thank mm -hmm. you.